Welcome back to our second session. For those who didn't attend the first session, I'm Dr. Matt McCormack, your MC for this evening. It's my honour to introduce our host for the, our session on thriving in the civilian workplace. In our research on veterans' transition, many participants spoke of a number of challenges adjusting to a new workplace, let alone thriving in it. In the military, we are used to walking into a meeting and immediately understanding someone's level of experience, their skills, and even where they have operationally served simply by looking at their uniform. Some transitioning veterans spoke of the challenge of walking into a room where you could not tell the CEO from the janitor. Some even reported that they did not know what was appropriate to where to work and there was no one to ask. Hosting this session is Brigadier Alison Cray, AMCSC retired. Recognised by Her Majesty the Queen with the award of a member of the Order of Australia in the General Division, not the Military Division, for her significant service to veterans and their families and to rowing. Alison was also awarded a Conspicuous Service Cross during her military career. Alison um, uh, transitioned after 30 years of service from the Australian Regular Army in March 2015. She gives freely of her time, especially to the veterans community. This year, she was recognised as an outstanding Defence Ambassador for the ACT. Alison is a UNSW Canberra alumna, having completed a Graduate Diploma of Management Studies in 1995 and a Master of Defence Studies in 1997. She was awarded the UNSW Alumni Award for Professional Achievement this year. She remains uh, the Chair of the ACT Ministerial Advisory Council for Veterans and their families. She's Chair of the Board of Governors of Military and Emergency Services Health Australia. Uh, President of ACT Rowing. She's also the Representative Colonel Commandant of the Royal Australian Corps of Signals and is a judge on the Prime Minister's Veterans Employment Program. All of this is done in addition to her paid work as the Chair of the SME Gateway Proprietary Limited. It is great to see you have chosen a quiet retirement, Alison, but we are most grateful to have you hosting our second session this evening, as well as sharing your experience about thriving in the civilian workplace. Uh, look, uh, thanks, Matt, and it's uh, great to be here tonight. Uh, thanks very much for UNSW uh, for organising this terrific opportunity to share our experiences. Um, I'm coming to you from Ngunnawal country uh, in the heart of Canberra, so uh, ter terrific to be here tonight and to recognise and acknowledge the traditional custodian custodians of the land in which we meet across Australia. But I also want to acknowledge uh, those who are serving in the Australian Defence Force now and those who've served and thank you for your service. Uh, what you do is important and significant and uh, you make a difference. You should know that and uh, we're very proud of what you do. And I also want to thank and acknowledge your families who also make a significant contribution. So I'm really pleased that this is called Thriving in the Civilian Workforce, this session, because uh, I think you can thrive. Um, I took a different part the military. Uh, uh, first, uh, I had the opportunity to actually um, pick three, uh, one of three roles when I left. So I pretty much left the military on one day and started uh, in a role the next day. And it was a full-time role for uh, uh, close to a year. Uh, and then I had to take carer's leave or and become a carer for the next 18 months uh, for my partner. So uh, being in the civilian workforce allowed me to do that. You can certainly do that in the military. Interestingly enough, it was force. And then uh, from there, uh, I decided that I didn't want to have a full time role and I really wanted to work what's called a portfolio career where I have lots of different little inputs, some of them paid, some of them voluntary, uh, doing things that I like doing and making a difference with things that I think are important to me. So uh, for me, I now believe that I thrive in the civilian workforce because I'm doing what I want to do in the way that I want to do it. 
I'm Alison, I'm not wearing my rank, I'm not wearing my uniform. I can trot out my title, I can be Brigadier Alison uh, for the roles, some of the roles that I have where it's appropriate, but I'm valued for who I am, what I do and, uh, and my intellect and my contributions. So for me, I think that's the opportunity to thrive. And all of you will have that opportunity uh, when you start to think about your next career, the next chapter of your lives, your family will be part of that journey. And I think it's really important to actually look at the opportunity that uh, the civilian workforce will give you. Some of you may choose a combination between uh, full-time civilian work might be full time and some reserve work still because you want to you might want to retain a connection some of you might move into completely unrelated roles and never step foot in a military organization ever again uh, it's really your choice now and uh, and it's a great opportunity to have so what I really want to do now is actually hear from our panellists who uh, have lots of fantastic opportunities to share with you. So introducing our panel today, uh, firstly, Beck Dyson, who's a uh, pretty energetic, focused project manager, uh, currently working at Pen10, one of the highly successful uh, veteran-owned uh, private industry cyber businesses created from scratch by amazing uh, entrepreneurs and Beck makes a difference every day uh, in uh, making a huge contribution to cyber in Australia and the world uh, and so very excited to hear about Beck's experiences in terms of thriving in the civilian workforce after a military career in the army spanning some 15 years uh, and Beck transitioned out in 2017 so she's been out for a little bit so I bet she's got lots of fantastic things to share. Uh, we also have Daniel Vincent, who's the National Education Manager at Soldier On, a terrific institution that uh, goes out of their way to help veterans. Uh, and Daniel's responsible for the development of educational programs to support both the veteran and corporate communities. Uh, Daniel was in the Army uh, for 16 years, multiple operational tours to East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan, and I have no doubt will have lots of valuable advice for you. And uh, last but certainly by no means least, Natalie Colbert. Natalie is an experienced company director like me, uh, founder and owner, uh, entrepreneur of CanPlay, uh, Torrens Early Learning, Urambi Early Learning and the Majura Park Child Care Centre. She's also a member of the Industry Advisory Committee on Veterans Employment. And uh, Natalie served over 18 years in the Royal Australian Air Force. So a wealth of military experience, but amazing experiences uh, of, for all three of our panellists outside uh, their military backgrounds. So let's get it all started. And I'm gonna start with you, I think, Beck. Uh, and my first question for all of you and uh, I'll ask each of you in turn, is uh, I'm really interested to know what you enjoy most about your new civilian work experience, your new civilian environment. Over to you, Beck. Thanks, Alison. That was a really nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here to be able to talk to you about some of my experiences um, in transition and, um, and obviously my current job. Um, it has taken a while to get to the point where I can say I am really excited to work at Pentan and proud as well. Um, it's a fantastic company, as Alison has already alluded to, um, and the reason why um, I, I like it so much is they are 110% people focused, and it's not just in what they say in their policies. It is they walk the walk, and um, you know they they have every interest of every individual at that at the company um, put first and that means things like um, completely trusting in every individual so there's no one looking over your shoulder you know making sure that you're online and working um, very flexible work arrangements so you know if you do have any personal um, things going on in your life as we all do it's not about shoving it under the carpet and showing up to work and pretending there's nothing going on um you know they're they're so supportive um not only with that sort of thing but also in your own development um and what i found 
um, was the difference with Pen10 compared to anyone anywhere else that I'd worked is I really felt that I had been mentored and um, and guided in my own profession as a project manager rather than just, you know, trying to show that I knew what I was doing when really I did have a level of learning to do myself. So I, I actually saw you know, a progression in my own, um, in my own development, which made me feel so much better about my job um, and and my ability. And it really gave me that confidence that I'd sort of missed um, when I left the army and, and had to start sort of from scratch again. Beck, how many roles have you had uh, between when you left the army before you landed the Pen 10 role? So I um, first got a job um, as I was leaving with Deloitte um, as a consultant and in strategy and operations and the role was in um, Canberra but I could work from Melbourne as well um, and then I moved on to BCT Solutions which is another veteran owned um, company. They were fantastic. Um, Angus and um, Batchy who started that company are just excellent and really supportive again um, however, it was just probably the work side of things where I was working in um, basically in Russell offices um, next to people that were in uniform and I suddenly wasn't in uniform and yeah, I just, I wanted to feel part of an organisation. Um, I did a very short stint um, with DFAT, um, working for myself, contracting and then uh, landed at Pen10 and all of those jobs were found through my own network that I had built through my time in defence. Uh, it's interesting you say uh, that it took you three to four type jobs before you landed the one that you're most comfortable in. Uh, there's actually some data, uh, might be old data now, but it seems on average that it takes veterans about three to four roles to settle into what they feel they're going to be really nailing. Um, I think that's a bit like a posting cycle. You know, you want to move every couple of years because you're so used to doing it. And then all of a sudden you realise you don't have to shift and then you land what, but there's other reasons, of course. Yeah. Um, thank you. So uh, I'm going to throw to you, Natalie, and ask. What, what do you enjoy most in your work environment? I think you've just gone off camera. And back on, uh, sorry, I was just unmuting myself and pressed the wrong button. Um, I think, uh, you know, similar to Beck in so many respects, the thing I like is uh, autonomy. Um, so in the military, we have these incredible experiences behind us and we have uh, amazing teams, but we're very much in a hierarchical structure um, where often you don't get the opportunity to make a lot of decisions uh, for yourself, you know. And um, what I've really loved is when you get out into the corporate world, um, you find suddenly that uh, a number of people around you really respect your ability to make decisions and uh, and suddenly you're, you're placed in more leadership positions. Um, and so that's one of the, the things I've really significantly noted. Lee, did it take you a while to get to that point? How many jobs did you have before you actually uh, the the sweet spot? I, I didn't. I actually was really unique. I started my company while I was still serving in the military. I um I loved my job so much. I was working in CDG as a project manager in aerospace. Um, I loved it so much, but then I started to grow a little baby, uh, and uh, and all I could work out was how do I keep my job while looking after my baby and uh, I came up with a unique concept while I went on maternity leave um, whilst like, I think the day before she was born that I should just start my own childcare company uh, and that would look after her uh, at the level I needed so I could go back to work. Um, so I'm, I'm really quite different in, in a lot of the experiences. So what I actually did is started the company up uh, during my maternity leave and then when that ended, I popped her in the childcare and uh, and I went back to my full work uh, from seven in the morning till six o'clock at night, uh, knowing that she was looked after. And uh, and that's kind of how I actually did it. So I did it as a double. Um, yeah, really, really different experience. Yeah. So that really emphasizes the getting transition ready while you're still in mantra. Yeah, yeah. And I did that. I actually did that for six years. I actually ran my company for six years while I was still in. Um, it was only, um, I guess, when it became a little, the, the company was expanding and my children were little and they needed me. And um, 
uh, it was it was finally a make or break decision, and I um, it, I had to make a choice. And I didn't really like making the choice at all. I wanted to stay both, um, but something had to give. And uh, unfortunately, that was my military career. So that's uh, that's just amazing. And uh, we've just I'll, I'll keep with you for a moment. Uh, we've just got a question that says that uh, uh, founding a childcare centre seems like a huge change. Uh, how did you use the skills that you had in the military and apply them in this entrepreneurial innovation type um, environment? In fact, when you read your uh, bio, uh, you've actually really uh, pivoted into something that's quite different. But it's very clear to me that you're using a lot of your latent military skills. Yeah, look, everything I did was 100% project management. Businesses, um, running a business is project management. It is systems engineering 101. Um, it is forming business plans. It is uh, structuring. It is managing people, leading teams, uh, allocating responsibility, being accountable uh, and being in a leadership role. And that's what I did. I did it on a really random large scale um, because I, uh, I'm a, such a military person that that's how we operate. Everyone here is nodding heads. You know, we don't we don't fly under the radar. We fly above it. And, um, yeah, so every skill that I had in the military made me the business operator that I was and every level of confidence and, and self-belief um, really came through. And I drew on my networks when I first was starting Majira Park Childcare. Um, all my first uh, clients, all the first customers were all my military friends who were like going, are you really are you starting a childcare? Okay. All right. We're coming. We're coming. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness. You know, uh, everyone was, it was there. And then we were hiring defense spouses and, um, you know, and I was, I was kind of um, really, I, I think I was really surprised uh, at the start, like I'd thrown this, huge amount of money into this gamble uh to run my own business and um and it was successful so um yeah, it's not always been successful let me be clear there are failures in business and uh and there are challenges that you would never expect but uh the rewards uh are always there and planning like any project manager any defense person knows you know peaceful planning leads to what it, oh forgotten it but you know that one um that sums it up perfectly and that is so true yeah fantastic uh daniel uh last but not least in this initial question uh what have you enjoyed most in your new work environment and you're really um in you've got a foot in several camps really now in your current role so i'm really interested to hear what pushes your buttons and what you enjoy um yeah well, thanks it's great to be here and what a what a panel that's all i can say so far listening to everyone's uh stories um well i'm i'm still fairly new to soldier on i've only been here for four months coming up now four and a half months so um what i've enjoyed so far is bring it back to what nat says autonomy the organization brought me in to enhance the education programs that we had and develop it into the future and you know the executive team have pretty much given me autonomy on I've just given a direction for, and I presented it like a project manager presented my plan forward and they said go for it and so I'm literally planning and developing processes along the way and trying to like build scholarship programs research pieces around how to hire and retain veterans and mentoring programs and you know so I'm really just going all out with our education program um, but I guess the best part is I get to uh, take all my failures and positive parts about transition and really talk to the two people who are transitioning and help them build that identity bridge across into that new career and and pretty much say it's okay you know it's it's going to be fine don't be don't be scared it's you know there's so many great people around here that are there to help you um, and you know I do this through our social connections team we uh, i get the luxury of going swimming every friday for work so it's fantastic i'm a triathlete so i'm like yes yeah, win um so and, and i'm i get to talk to people at the pool and in you know when their guards are down and just really understand what they're about and understand what their next journey is and help them through the journey that i guess that's what i like about the role and uh how yeah. long did it take you to get into the the role that you're in now? 
Uh, so this is, uh, so three roles I was in recruiting and in the disability sector before this. So I guess the disability sector was really hard for me to leave because uh, the organisation I worked for were fantastic. And it was one of those ones where I was like, ah, oh, I don't want to go, but doing that role is what helped me take this role. So I, I, you know, recruitment was fantastic. You made, I made tons of money and it was uh, fast paced. But when I really looked at my values and what I wanted to do and what made me happy, it did, that was not what made me happy. And so I reevaluated myself and went, I joined the military to serve. How do I give back to society? What do I do for society? So I reevaluated and went into, um, into the disability sector and said, I want to go help those who are less fortunate for me, my, uh, than me, and which then made me take a look at myself as a person with my mental health issues, my physical injuries. And I, I reflected upon myself and said, well, do you know what? I don't, I'm, I'm okay if, you know, dealing with some of these people who are judged on first appearance. I'm, I'm okay. Um, I can do this and then it helped me move into this role here. So where I can try and help veterans in that same space. So yeah, so three, you, three roles. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. The average uh, sort of works, works out, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. you, you said something that really resonates with me there, uh, Daniel, in that uh, you looked at what pushes your buttons and, it, yeah. and what fulfills you. And that was help. That, and in fact, all three of you have said that. Uh, that guided you in your decisions around whether you were in the right place in your transition and you gave yourself permission to leave a role yeah. to find another role. But uh, the thing that I've picked up from all of you is in all of your roles, you've grown a little bit each time and that's given you another jump start into your next role. So uh, it's, uh, it's quite lib for me. to actually uh, be able to understand what boxes and then choose the environment in which I want to be part of or leave the environment if I'm not comfortable with it. And I think you can do that to a little extent in the military, but you're absolutely in the jump seat when you're in the civilian workforce. And that's, I think, the, the thing that uh, is really valuable. Um, I've got a couple of questions that uh, I want to play out here. Uh, and probably to you, by surprise, when you entered the civilian workforce for the first time. So without scaring everyone, uh, to be honest, I didn't think that transition would be that hard. Um, I was offered a job um, with Deloitte uh, while I was still serving. It was my second year as an OC. Um, and, you know, for me, that was what I'd always wanted to do. Just wanted to make OC, had, a, had just come back from a field trip. It was really successful. Um, and so to me, I'd sort of reached the pinnacle. I'd obviously I'd done a few um, deployments and all that sort of thing, had an awesome career, really loved my time. But, um, you know, I, I was still single at the time. I really wanted to, you know, have a chance of having my own family. Um, and I felt that defence was, you know, making that quite difficult with all the moving around and stuff like that. So, you know, this opportunity came up and I went for it. Um, it all happened very quickly. I made that decision and, and you know, would do not regret it at all. But I actually did end up going through a, a stage of depression for probably 12 or 18 months um, where, you know, I did need to seek support. Um, you know, I got injured very quickly after I left defence. I was a very keen triathlete as well. Um, and my outlet was exercising and doing really long runs and that made me feel great. Um, and not being able to do that also was difficult. And to go hand in hand with that, um, you know, just the change in, in finances and that, I did run into some issues with finances because I just hadn't spent that time to sort of reevaluate my pay and all the extra expenses that you would have when you left defence. Um, and, and then, you know, without, you know, being um, an alcoholic, I definitely had a dependence on alcohol as well. And so, you know, I had the whole kit and caboodle, but I was very self-aware and um, I, I knew what I wanted as part of this change and, and what you said before, Alison, about, 
Um, you know, you, you need those values to guide your decision making. And my first big decision was, um, you know, originally I was going to move back to Melbourne when I got out because that's where my family is. But I needed my support network, my friends, those people that I had spent my time in the military with who are like my family. Um, I joined straight from school. So they were my family when I left home. And so that was my first big decision to stay in Canberra. Um, and then the next one was to move companies. So I only managed to stay eight months at Deloitte. It wasn't the right culture and organisation for me. Um, you know, I, I did some volunteer work at the national parks because I felt that I needed to give some service and, and I went and, and seek support through DVA with um, mental health and saw a psych, got a good GP. I, I got myself sorted, but, um, you know, I was really surprised. I, I'm a strong person. I never thought that I would go through something like that, but that loss of identity and, and all the changes going on and that, that loss of confidence that came with it was definitely something that was really difficult. And, you know, not to scare you again, but it's just something to be aware of. And by being at this transition event, I think you, you're putting the right foot forward and in, in just being ready for, for any of those changes. Um, so, so yeah, that was my big surprise. Um, and four and a half years later, I have a little family. Um, I have a great job. I, I have a, a great house that we've bought that we'll be renovating for the next 20 years. Um, but, you know, I'm super happy and, and definitely glad I've made that decision, but it, it didn't come easy. So. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. And I think that reinforces in the last session uh, that the common theme was get transition ready, take the time while you're serving to get ready. And it sounds to, and, and also know who you are in terms of your identity and work out a way uh, to understand what your identity might be like in your new environment. And it sounds to me that because you were given an opportunity so quickly, uh, those two defining steps that you might have uh, taken the time to do in the normal course of events uh, actually didn't play out in quite the same way. So uh, you probably just did it a little tougher. And yeah. if people are able to take the time to transition and prepare, uh, you know, it won't necessarily always be easy, but maybe it won't be really hard. So I, I really think your advice and your comments uh, are just uh, really good at helping people realise that it is not always an easy route, but you can actually define the route, uh, but you need to be honest with yourself along the way. And so that, I think that's really special. Uh, Daniel, what surprised you? I'm, I'm similar to Beck on my transition, um, but I I was uh, one of the, I ran transitions in Queensland. So I kind of knew everything about transitioning. Um, so I, the, the thing that surprised me is, I try to get out naturally and um, I wrecked my spine, wrecked my um, neck, everything like that through the combat calls that I was a part of. And um, just the surprise of when they HIA'd me and told me um, I'm being medically separated, but I'd already made that uh, made that decision that I was getting out. So my, my, my mindset was I'm leaving anyway. I had a job to go to. Um, so I got HIA'd and it was all like, uh, it took another 18 months before I actually separated and defense would call me back in um, to do uh, reasonable checkups, I guess. And not to like, uh, I can see the questions there, what can veterans, um, uh, what can employment uh, employers do to support veterans in transitioning? I'll just, uh, there is, um, we're working on that. We're working with organizations at the moment. Soldier On is developing a tool toolkit booklet with a multitude of organizations to to develop that because everybody does amazing things. Um, all these organizations are doing great things. So we're trying to bring it under one umbrella. And so people transitioning out can then go, okay, this is what it's all about. Because my first organization is like, um, just like Beck, I lasted four months. I, it was walking out, I was task orientated, you know, a corporal, you know, five tours. I was, yeah, okay. I just wanted to do my job. And I was surrounded by people that didn't talk my language, who cared more about eating pizza. And um, I was like, what, where am I? 
And the hardest thing for me was my wife was pretty high up in HR and I said, how do I resign? You know, what do I do? And she like started laughing at me because, you know, that to her, that was quite easy. So this was a shock to me. I didn't know any of this, any of that. How do I leave this job? I don't like it. And, uh, and then I got headhunted into another firm and I was like, I don't know what is happening here. Um, another company wants to hire me. What do I do? And she's like, just resign, walk in, tell them you're leaving. And I was like, okay. Cause knowing that I still, I'm still transitioning out of defense at this stage and I'm not completely separated. So I'm like, this is taking 18 months. I'm four months in, I'm getting, ah. Oh. So that was my surprise was like, how do I do all of this? Um, and I, you know, luckily I had a really, I've got a really good wife. She talked me through it. I've got a really good network. They all had a bit of a giggle as well because they've all been out and they were just like, hey, just walk in and resign, Dan. Just tell them you're leaving. They're probably going to kick you out. And um, I was like, okay. And that's exactly what happened. They told me to leave. And I was like, what does that mean? What do, you, do I, am I allowed to get my lunch from the fridge? Am I allowed to clean my desk? You know, th these are all the questions that I'm pretty sure people will be thinking. And I lived it and I was like, oh, okay. And I like walked out with my bag with, I already had a contract in my, in my, in my satchel from the other company. And I walked back up with a signed contract and gave it to that company and started like two days later. So it was a big shock, big culture shock to me. Like just what, what, what is happening here and trying to understand and navigate all of that. And that's why I bring it back to that. Say we're trying to provide, get organizations to give us all the good parts and then speak our language and then understand what we've done and understand where we come from and trying to have uh, champions in each organization that they can fall, fall back on and support and that that's where they can go to if they need it and work with organizations like Soldier On, RSL um, and all of them, other all the other ESOs that are out there. So trying to educate, I'll bring it back to education. So educating yourself to getting out and the other one is Alison and Nat have already said it is transition. If you treat your first day of service as your first day of transition, you'll start to educate yourself all the way through the process and you'll know what is out there because nothing is uh, permanent these days. You could break your knee in the, you know, in six months of in the military, what happens after that? And they're going to kick you out medically. I faced that early on in my career when I, when I busted my spine up, they were medically going to medically separate me and I fought it and I stayed in. Um, and because I didn't know what was out there, I was 26, you know, infantry soldier, infantry corporal. I was like, man, what's, what's life going to be like out there? So I fought it and I managed to stay. But if you treat your first day of service, like your first day of transition, reach out to people and educate yourself. That's what I would do. It will, will stop that shock of what I did. How do I resign? How do I sign this contract? What is happening here? I have no, I was like a six year old kid running around in the, in the playground, not knowing what to do. But I was and the interesting, interesting thing for me is that uh, there would be people who've only ever had civilian careers who would not know how to resign and would not know uh, what questions to ask. So uh, I guess the comment that I would make to everyone is you're not alone. So you need to surround yourself uh, with people who you can talk to, uh, who actually do have um, some experience, uh, like your very good wife, uh, Daniel, who basically could give you the advice. So, uh, you know, just as you do with uh, your military mates where you've got a cohort of people who you trust and relate to and can go to for advice, when you're thinking, uh, when you when you start to think about who are you, uh, friends, your civilian network, uh, be they the families of your kids who go to school, or if you don't have any, start to join a sporting club and establish your new civilian community. Have people that you can just go and ask questions. Maybe I could just um, go ahead and answer that question Alison would have asked me next. Um, for everyone out there, I, my experience is a bit different to Beck's and, and Daniel's. And gosh, I love, Daniel, what you said about um, first day in thinking about where you're going in the future. 
my biggest surprise was that I always thought I would probably end up back in the military. I thought, oh, I'll duck out and I'll raise my children and I'll do this bit of a business thing, but then I'll I'll, I'll stay in the reserves and I'll do exercises and I'll I'll get back in. Um, and uh, within about a couple of weeks, and I was transition ready. Let's let's be clear. I had I had a, a really safe spot I was going into in my own company. Um, I within a couple of weeks I um, was out at a coffee shop and I was with a with a colleague who was a mentor who was a, an ex military senior officer who looked after me when I was leaving, and um, we we're having a coffee and a cake in a cafe during the day. And I was like, what, what is this? You know, this is, I'm not on the clock. I'm not on anybody's clock. I can actually sit here, not in uniform with my hair out and, uh, and I can relax. So that was a really big thing for me um, to, to sit there and say, oh, actually, I, I'm really enjoying this. And I'm allowed to enjoy this. I'm allowed to actually say it's the right time to leave. And I've got heaps more I can do in this space and um but it's okay to go it was the right time to go and that's a really big thing um to to sit there and go when when are you ready what are you going to do how are you going to do it and and plot some future ideas because they're going to change and I think Alison's made that really clear and we know that from the veterans employment uh, committee I work on is that um, most veterans leave and they undersell themselves in their first couple of jobs and they they try and choose a, a first um, job that feels safe uh, and, it, and it's first good opportunity and it's uh, and it's just like their first soft landing and then from there they start to realize what their skills and capabilities and talents are and uh, and they start to realize how well respected they are in the workforce and, and what they can do and they'll work out that the team either is or isn't for them it is or or isn't the fit for them and it takes a couple of times until you kind of work that out and that was that's a bit of a surprise I think for most people I know who've gotten out who've all gone oh hang on actually I can do I can do something that really works for me um so sorry Alison and you're back I was just answering that question in your absence about what surprised me and in summary it was going out for a coffee and uh and second um how much the fact is I've never put my uniform back on which I, I just didn't expect at all didn't expect yeah five years out now and I um, I'm just no longer a reservist and uh and I I always thought I would be yeah a contribution in a different way so that's the key thanks for holding the fort I want to tackle some of the questions that we've got uh, on the live Q&A um, a really good question what would uh, you recommend uh, to concentrate on having in your toolkit before you leave is it something like uh, preparing for interviews is it resume writing my big tip is uh, think about what you don't like doing now and don't do it ever again think about what you like doing now and what pushes your buttons around the environment that you're in and and start to look for organizations that you think might be similar so that it's uh and and establish your circle of uh civilian friends to provide you advice on who you are as a person and how they see you, because that'll help you. So they're my tips. Uh, what do you reckon, Daniel? What are your tips for a toolkit to get ready? Yeah, some Very similar to yourself. Uh, educate yourself with as much uh, knowledge of how to transition, what is out there, uh, people that you can, that can help you bring, as, as you said, Alison, take this time to really understand what you want to do um, because it's like a new lease on life. You 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 get a, it's like a second chance. You get to move on and you get to pick what you want to do now. Um, you're not having the military dictate to you what you're going to do, where you're being posted, what you're gonna you know, what job, what what anything. You are now in the driver's seat, and you get to dictate for resume writing and all that stuff as well. Yeah, it's great. Interview prep is fantastic if you haven't interviewed. You know, like I'm, you know, I do it all the time is I'll do interview prep. Our entire team does interview prep. We'll sit down with you and talk with you and ask you questions and help you interview and break it all down. Um, that is, that, that can be very nerve wracking. 
um, for people who have never done it, especially if you've done six years in the army and then you're getting out and you're trying to do an interview for the first time. So all those tools are, are great. Everything is just educate yourself. That's all I can say is meet people, put yourself out there. Uh, LinkedIn is a great tool for that. People will help you if you ask for it. And that coffee catch-up that you have yeah. with someone who's already in the civilian workforce might actually be your next employer. You just never know. So Correct. when you ask, when you ask a mate, or ask someone you know, or ask someone who's in the civilian workforce who you might previously have worked with, uh, they'll give you some great advice. But they also might employ you. You just need to Correct. reach out. Uh, Beck, what's your top tips for a toolkit? Um, for me, and I guess it plays to my strengths, is the network. My network was the most important thing to me. That's how I got my first job. But um, also there's a lot of events on as well that you can go to um, and get involved in. There's a lot of um, groups that you can be involved in through Defence. I um, participated in the Chief Executive Women's Program. Um, there were some great contacts in that. Um, I went to the Defence in Business seminars that were being conducted in Brisbane. Um, you know, I met other Deloitte people there. Um, and, you know, the, the job that I got with Deloitte was through someone that I had worked with in the Army who then worked at Deloitte and, and recommended me and helped me out with the interviews and resumes and all that sort of thing. So for me, it was definitely always my network. I've never got a job um, through just submitting a CV to, you know, blindly to a company. It's always been through word of mouth. And I guess if you're in um, defence-related jobs, and that, that is the easy way to do it, um, that obviously if you're going cold into jobs where you don't know anyone, then your CV is going to be a lot more important. Um, and, and also, yeah, just being able to communicate well when you do have your interviews. Um, the other part that I wanted to go back to was how important um, knowing why the reasons why you're leaving and what you what you want to change when you do leave because it's so hard to make decisions when you literally can do whatever you want and you've got no guide and so for me my guide was you know I, I want to have a job that supports me being able to settle and have a family it's so easy to go after the shiny things. You know, I could have had a very exciting job with DFAT, um, traveling and doing all that fun stuff, but then I would be traveling and being posted around the place. And, and so that was, you know, it's the same carrot that army always dangles. It's the exciting stuff that maybe at this point in my life and, um, and what I wanted to achieve at that, this age and that time in my life wasn't aligned anymore. Um, and so it was hard to sort of say no to the exciting stuff um, and, and try to do something that is a little bit more secure and settled and, and then take that time to learn that new sort of job. I mean, I was a truckie. I now work in cyber security, very different. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it doesn't mean that, um, you know, you can't do it. You've got these skills that are very, very valuable to um, to any employer, not just defence-related ones as well. So you've got to remember that. Um, and you'll probably need a few veterans there reminding you of the value of those skills that you do have because you will undersell yourself. And you've got a security clearance that, yeah. uh, <laughs> that people highly value and, uh, and you can reskill and retrain and there are a whole bunch of uh, professional development programs in the military uh, as you're transitioning. Um, but, you know, reskilling is a great opportunity if that's what you want to do. So if you wanted to go out and do a cyber course now, Beck, there are a myriad um, cyber, cyber 101 courses that you can do that will actually start a, a complete new career. Uh, and, you know, I think sometimes we just need to have the courage to back ourselves. We so underestimate our capacity, but we survived amazingly in the military. So you, you sort of wonder why we don't back ourselves more. Um, Beck, your, uh, sorry, um, Natalie, your toolkit tips? My biggest toolkit is probably having self-confidence. Um, I think for most of the um, attendees tonight, um, you probably unconsciously are underselling your skills and capability as you transition out into the workforce. Um, anyone who's been in the military has a natural level of integrity, leadership, competence and teamwork. Uh, and those things 
a mean that you will thrive in the civilian workforce, which is the whole topic of tonight's discussion. Um, what I find frequently, and, and I see it all the time, is that um, a lot of people leaving the Defence Force are a little bit unsure of what they um, should put on their resumes and, and how they should say that. Look, on my LinkedIn profile, my first two words are military veteran. Um, because that is something to be incredibly proud of and it does resonate really well in the civilian workforce. Don't feel that you don't have all these skills because you can't write a resume that says that you've done these things. Um, you know, Daniel as a, as a corporal in the infantry is an incredible leader of people. Uh, he's got HR skills, leadership skills, organisation, time management, dedication, integrity. You know, back in her military career, uh, and Alison the same, incredible um, achievements in, in project management and leadership of, of people. And that goes into every single job you will ever do. So if you write your resume and you go into an interview, put that first, you know, what you have. Um, you are reliable, you are full of integrity, you are capable um, and, and you will be an asset to any workplace you go into. So that's the first tool you, you need is yourself, is to be confident of, of who you are and don't feel that you can't go into a really diverse field and make incredible achievements because you can. Um, you know, and there are so many organisations out there. I'm going to give a shout to Daniel with Soldier On. They are doing incredible things with people leaving the military. Um, so are the RSL organisations. Um, there are so many people out there who want to help you um, to, to be your best self as you leave. Um, you know, at that time when you're ready to go, you can continue to be so successful um, and there's a lot of people who who will be mentors and support and guidance for you and telling you that you've got this you can do this and you're gonna you're gonna be awesome at it um, so that's all I really wanted to say because uh, I know we're coming towards the end and uh, the veteran employee uh, the veteran employer tick a lot of businesses now will show that on their website so there's a couple of questions around you know how do they know whether there's good veteran employment uh, programs you know in a business look for the veteran employer tick because uh, they've got to meet some thresholds to actually get that tick uh, there's a, a whole uh, federal government initiative around veteran employment. Um, Natalie's part of that process to help inform and generate uh, good quality outcomes for veterans to actually show that we're valuable. Half the questions around, is there a course that tells us about how not to talk in a rhythm in, uh, in my first role uh, to a bunch of civilians and they thought I was on drugs? So. Um, uh, I think uh, it, there isn't a course. Uh, I think you've got to test and adjust a little bit uh, and you'll quickly work out what resonates with them. But some of the language that we have in the military is really portable uh, when we talk about leadership and synchronising and coordinating and leading and uh, caring about our people and how we work with our people. That, that translates perfectly every time. Uh, so it uh, looks like we might have lost Daniel very briefly, oh. but uh, in sort of 15 seconds or less, uh, Beck, what is the one piece of advice you want to give to our listeners around thriving in the workplace, in the civilian workplace, thriving in their new environment? Um, surrounding yourself with a strong support network of um, some veterans and some existing defence people. Thank you. And you, Beck? Oh, sorry, you, Natalie. I keep doing that. It's terrible. That's all right. Beck and I are really similar. <laughs> um, uh, you know, in that respect, I'd say uh, do surround yourself with a team of people you can call on. Find a mentor. Um, you know, there are so many organisations who want to help you. I've certainly mentored a heap of really uh, diverse people. Uh, people as they've been leaving the military and I'm always delighted to and you'll find so many people who want to help you um, and then when you know when the times are tricky they're there for you and they will tell you what to wear because I saw there was a question about what do I wear to the interview how do I handle the interview you know I look soldier on and, and all these great organizations that you'll see during your transition they're there and they will walk you through and hold your hand and, and help you out. And if it doesn't work, they'll help you into the next career as well. I've almost got a civilian uniform where I wear.
all the time. It's, uh, it's quite interesting how I haven't even broken that cycle. Uh, I really apologise to those people who I haven't quite nailed all the questions on. There's a question around what academic groups can you get involved in if you wish to undertake higher education. Get in touch with